everybody, and welcome to 3D Hangout. It is September 4th. I'm your host, Matt Griffin, here in the heart of the Adafruit factory in New York City. And with me each week are Noe and Pedro Ruiz at Adafruit South. Hey, guys. How are you guys doing? Hey, Matt. What's going on? I'm hey, guys. Pedro Ruiz, creative technologist here at Adafruit. Joining me is my brother, Noe Ruiz. Hi, guys. I'm Noe Ruiz, designer here at Adafruit. Uh, every week, we hang out live to share the latest in 3D news, uh, designs from the Adafruit Workbench, designs from the Adafruit community, and all sorts of resources to help you make better projects with 3D and electronics. So what segments do we have today? All right, coming up on the show, new prototyping. That's right. We'll take a look at what's in the works and the future projects. We'll look at some of the 3D news. All the news that's fit to print. We love scouring the news for all amazing stories. <laughs> yes, we do. We'll look at this week's video. Where it features original designs in Adafruit gear. Right this week, a giant wearable helmet. Giant. Layer by layer. And a segment where we break down some of the design techniques that went into the project. How to model the helmet. And the community spotlight. Yeah, and this week we have a very special community spotlight. We're spotlighting a lot of projects in the desktop 3D printing world involving 3D printing and music in honor of the special project today. So, uh, starting with the first part, what are you guys prototyping right now? All right. We're working on a lot of collaboration projects with Becky Stern, our awesome director of wearable electronics. Uh, this is a, a future wearable project that's uh, combining 3D printing. Like we are doing some 3D stencils that we will be showing in our future. Very cool. With your prints. And we're also doing some replica stuff inspired by Hollywood, and like combining it with functional uh, circuitry. Right, so. with Halloween coming up, we're working on some props and other cosplay-inspired 3D printing projects. So yeah, look out for all those. Yeah. Awesome. And I have uh, been spending some time uh, playing around with my new 3D scanner, trying to find good routes because it's a, it's a higher resolution desktop scanner than I've used before uh, to see if I can use it to help me quickly make uh, cases for, um, you know, integrate these parts into enclosures. It's working so-so. I'm still trying to find some good settings and tricks. And I'm spending a lot of time printing on some new machines that I'll be sharing in the near future. OK, so we're, uh, we're going to dive right into our news segment now. And here we go. Oops, but not that one. <laughs> I fell for the wrong file. OK, there we go. OK, so on the Adafruit blog today, for 3D Thursday, we have a lot of really neat projects. And a couple we wanted to highlight, uh, starting with this one, uh, print with four extruders simultaneously on this Polar Theta printer. So this is a project from Tyler Anderson. And uh, it is a, a Polar-style uh, robot. And uh, there aren't that many Polar robots in 3D printing. A Polar approach. Um, instead of working on a Cartesian grid, it's, it's working on, uh, on polar coordinates. And it's using a rotational uh, axis and uh, these arms that sort of bend in. Uh, you can see a little bit as it's behaving there. And you're not just right able to here. make round things. Here is a little brief glimpse of uh, the prototype in progress, printing a bunch of octopus uh, pieces at the same time. Pretty neat, because uh, there, there are some uh, advantages to using this style. Uh, in particular, if you have a, a heavy extruder, um, and you potentially can print in on all four extruders at the same time, which could mean, uh, potentially, one of the things they're considering, um, printing different materials in each head, moving around, and kind of building up that way. It's such an awesome approach that I haven't even thought of yet. Just when you think, you know, everybody's figured out, you know, with the Delta Box and all these different types of printers, it comes along with a completely different concept that you know, is 
so cool to, it looks like the um, dual experience has are way cleaner than uh, even the traditional way. Yeah. So it's a working prototype. I can't wait to see what he, what he creates. So next item, we have uh, Anouk uh, and Couleur, uh two that are involved with fashion, and in particular doing a lot of interesting things in 3D printed fashion. And they have a new project that is an open source 3D printed dress where they're encouraging lots of people to print elements and uh, send them in. So they have a basic design, and you can sort of riff on it and uh, build out your, your element to send in. And we were very excited to see that they're featuring the Adafruit NeoPixel rings uh, as an encouraged element of the design. Here's some prints from uh, the samples so far. They have uh, an Instructables up that shows how you can participate if you want to. NeoPixel rings, a million and one uses. This is like uh, we the builders, but we're building a dress. This is really awesome. So this project is a, a shoe project. We've shown a couple of shoe projects because it's, it's kind of a preoccupation uh, in the design community um, and a really great challenge. Well, each of these designed sort of heels is uh, a visualization of a seven deadly sins. Sort of a fun place to start. So there's that basic shape there at bottom. And each of these designs are, are building out and sort of taking the, the designer's sort of inspiration of how to sort of address in, in shoe form the seven deadly sense. Kind of an unusual project. Um, so, and then there's just one last segment to share uh, for this moment. Uh, news from NASA. NASA's been pushing a lot of interesting 3D printed elements for uh, a couple of years now. They've been uh, slowly bringing it in, first for educational reasons and, and now increasingly for production. And uh, they did a test with a, uh, a, a rocket fuel injector. And what's sort of interesting about this is this is a part that was uh, 40 parts when it was originally designed. And they found a way to print it in one piece. Um, which is uh, has a lot of a lot of advantages in terms of you know production possibilities, uh, but also uh, potentially for uh, weight and efficiency uh, and all the things that you must think about when you're thinking about space. So those are some of the highlights from the blog, and you should go check out all the posts that we put up today to see uh, the things that we has struck us this week. And you guys have completed and now are sharing. One of my favorite projects you guys have done so far. Tell us about the Daft Punk helmet. Thank you. So this week, um, our project video is a DIY Daft Punk inspired helmet. Um, Pedro, tell us about this awesome project. What kind of gave you the inspiration to make this thing? Uh, so yeah, Lamar just said, hey, make a Daft Punk helmet. So <laughs> <laughs> we were on the show and tell us, yeah, that would be a cool idea. So a couple days later, Pedro whipped one up. Yeah, so um, one of the we wanted to make something that, um, that if you can go through Thingiverse or any of the STL uh, repositories out there. There are some helmets out there, but they're all like, you know, like low poly um, res. Uh, they're all like, you know, you can see like all the details in them. Um, it's like very low resolution, and they're all like in pieces. And it's really to hard to make one out of just sort of the traditional means of making props and stuff. So this is actually a really easy uh, build in terms of the actual part and the circuitry. It's just uh, two trinket microcontrollers, with like seven bucks each, and a strip of NeoPixel ring, or NeoPixel strips. So, uh, one, two, three D. <laughs> again, big shout out to the awesome uh, fluidity of this application. Yeah. The uh, print time on this guy is about forty nine hours, fifty hours. <laughs> so that, that's fantastic. And I, I love that. Um, what what we consider easy or difficult in desktop three D printing changes so fast. So this project is a really challenging one, but uh, you guys have a level of comfort with it, and you have, um, you know, made a bunch of these now, or well, a pair of these, uh, which is really exciting. I've been sitting here setting this um, ever since. Uh, One of the down. challenges and hard things about printing something so big is getting it off the printer. Um, most people will know that they have a 3D printer. It, it's, it's, it can be kind of dangerous sometimes. So in, in this project, we're using a flexible build plate. So we're able to just give it that little bit of flex, 
no fuss, no mess. It comes off nicely. Um, we, you know, we added some spray paint to it just to really give it that uh, that nice look. I mean, we could do it with a dual extruder, but we don't have a dual extruder at the moment. And uh, spray painting seems to be uh, a good alternative, really. So yeah, I mean, even with the PLA uh, gold uh, that we have, um, it wouldn't give him the, the shininess that you can do with the spray paint. So here we're just using some masking tape, and it's when you have to add promo fixes here. Yeah. So the inside of the helmet is um. It's did you say it's comfortable? <laughs> yeah, it is comfortable because you, you depending on your head size, of course. Um, there's some like padding things you can get on there. And I think you gotta take your glasses off to put it on. Yeah. The thing awesome. about the the NeoPixel strips is they come with these uh, silicone uh, sheeting, so it, it really protects it against moisture or anything like that that might get into it. And you're you're pretty much free to to place the LEDs however you want, add as many strips as you want. Oh, yeah. Your uh, animation is more complex. You just uh, using four for the front and two for the sides. Yeah, and actually something cool that you did, you added these little NinjaFlex uh, pockets. Yeah, that's something that unfortunately the, the way that production times works on these videos, uh, uh, we didn't have time to show the little NinjaFlex pockets that we have on the inside here. Oh, cool. Yeah. So we were just using those to hold the batteries in place. Of course, it's featuring code from a world famous Phil B here. It's going to be fire code animation in the rainbow code on the sides. You get the complete sketch on learn.afp.com. Where you can also get the the, the STLs and um, any details on uh, assembly. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah, so let's go ahead and jump in and see how we put this. All righty. Oh, big <laughs> shout outs to X Robots, James Bruton, who uh, took this off this really cool way to sort of design the. Um, like the rounded structure of the helmet. Because originally I was going to do this all in Maya, which would have led to heavy polygons and you know, having to do that and all that just to get it to slice properly. So here we're using it. You start with a big cube, which is like awesome. You would think you start with like a circle or a torus. No, I start with a cube. Yeah, you know, so we're doing fillet. a giant fillet on this. Uh, of course, first of all, uh, you have to measure your head, and after you get all those dimensions, build the helmet or build the box around that size. So uh, after the fillet, we're going to select the uh, face here, and uh, a very awesome trick here is to revolve right around the edge point right there. Oh, so cool. once you click on that, you uh, can edit the degrees of the uh, revolve, Ooh. and we'll go uh, revolve this around to get something that looks like this. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and duplicate that and actually um, select all the faces and sort of uh, switch it down just to make a smaller version. It's going to be the back of the helmet here. So we'll combine those two. And then um, we'll draw, start drawing out the little uh, ear detail here. Oh, cool. So it's just like a big rectangle, and you, you add a fillet to the top there. Yeah, so it's just this little oh. here. And then we're going to uh, select the edges here, sort of um, tweak the um, edges so we have sort of like a, an outward flowing um, helmet there. Yeah, one, two, three gives you like that. full control over vertexes, edges, faces, all the, all the little nitty gritty stuff that it takes to make a really custom design. Did, did you find that? Uh, that it was easier to use the, the filleting approach instead of using like a, a curve and Boolean adding because of uh, it's just so cool. you throw it on there, you get your little interactive manipulator. Mm -hmm. really yes, nice. because uh, doing things like that, yeah, you might get the sizing wrong, you gotta maybe curve or you know, so can like you edit things <laughs> you build them. This is a cool tip um, on using the project uh, sketch. Yeah, so for making the little ear part here, um, and in editing uh, some of the faces, like if you want to make sort of a taper, it's not very apparent how you can do it. So um, one of the ways to, to do that is by extruding a new um, uh, solid all of that. So of since I've sketch. already built in, so since I've already built this, um, we could use a, proje a projection on an existing plane here. So we're clicking on the face and making another copy of that. And once you do that, it allows you to um, click on the little handle there and edit the degree of taper that you can add to the ear code. We we'll use that and apply a little filler on that to give it a nice little smooth uh, edge, little detail there. And we'll line those up with the other um, little uh, ear pieces there. And so to create some of the carving and the detail that are inside of the helmet, uh, we'll duplicate one of the ear pieces, select the faces, and um, sort of scale it out just a little bit more bigger than the original. And we're going to place that right on top of there and just do like the uh, Boolean uh, subtract on that to add some of the chiseling uh, details on there. 
helmets. And you can see that we did that with all of the sort of trimmings all around the helmet. The little face part there, the top. And this is uh, something that you guys could take on and definitely just print the, the uh, framing structure if you wanted. If you wanted to sort of build the um, front part here with, like, say, like some Acrylic, acrylics or something uh, like that, or some sort of moldable plastic that you can actually see through. Yeah. And here we're, instead of doing just a regular shell, we have to sort of build our own custom shell because of the way that the ear detail is here. Mm -hmm. We have, like, different seam in um, sort, of, sort of the way it cuts in for the ear. So we've got to build uh, a separate sort of uh, model that has a little difficulties for that. It reminds me of uh, traditional manufacturing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And negative. Uh -huh. Yeah, so basically negative, yeah. yeah cool. So, so since you're going to be wearing it, yeah, you got to really um, check out on the inside and sort of, uh, sort of visualize where the components are going to be touching up against your head and sort of smooth and curve those out so you're not getting stressed. That's what we're doing here. Applying a bevel and a uh, oh, sorry, chamfer. Chamfer. And um, throughout the whole model, you can see that there's no support material, there's no wraps or anything like that. And that's mainly because of the, all the chamfering and the uh, Phillips that we're using. And we have a couple pictures here. After this, this is the front one. The front there. It is available. Um, it, did you did you give away all the um, the versions? All, all of the, the versions, all of the solids um, are free to download. Mm -hmm. um, I went to 3D Gallery. You can get all the solids there. Measure head, adjust. Uh -huh. uh -huh. This is a crazy photo. This is um, you snapped a photo of it while it was printing the top of it. This is like the Taz at its finest, right? Because it's defying gravity here. Yeah, so it's printing almost completely at 90 degrees here. You can pop the helmet, and yeah, um, you can take a look at inside. Uh, yeah, a lot of the material held on on there. And I think we have more photos of it, like when it's printing all this part right here. It's printing right in the air. It's just a little bit of. Clean up. There aren't any supports to clean up, but you get a little bit of goober. Yeah, we have a lot of. Yeah, clean. looking at the surface of this one, it's it's really it's really clean, and uh, it's um, it, it recovers to to bridge over that top really well. Yeah, we got some awesome pliers in the shop that cleans that up. Little flat uh, diagonal haku pliers. Um, this is what it looks like inside the helmet. So as we said before, you can add as many um, strips as you want to sort of make like a, one of the, uh, what was it, the video walls. You can, sure. You can get that. And so talk a little bit about the wiring. So, oh, so the wiring, we're using the new silicone covered wiring we have in the shop. Uh, this is great for doing a lot of flexible things, um, for like heat and things like that. Um, sure. Uh, pump more bolts into it without it melting. <laughs> sure. And um, sort of the connection, sort of a Y connection. To, uh, to make it easier on the circuit. Cool. So imagine if uh, you were trying to, to design this in like an animation or you know computer graphics tool like Maya. Um, how how would you have approached this differently? It seems like such a tidy list of things once you worked out which decisions you wanted to make. So it would have been a lot of um, linear informers. A lot of linear informers. <laughs> a lot of um, importing hats that wouldn't be the right size and <laughs> before um, the, the final export would have been like a probably pretty heavy uh, polygon um, model that you know once it's printed you, you would have been able to see all of the sort of like I, mean, I know low poly is sort of the trend right now going on <laughs> and, you know, like we low, challenge low you to make it low res ones. yeah but um, sometimes you want higher res for you know that smooth finish and, um, so yeah uh, yeah, coming out of Maya would have been a little bit more difficult. That would have been a bigger file. And we wouldn't have the best scaling, too. The scaling, yeah. Some of the scaling is a little uh, messed up in there. Uh, we wouldn't be able to you know, give you guys a free file to sort of mess with yeah, the originals. It's really That's great. And uh, so you know, we have this, this thing as a result. And uh, it's both easier to print and um, easier to adjust. I love it. It's fun to photograph. It really is. Uh, throw throw a, a low shutter speed on there and have good times. Yeah, and the Taz, a uh, very great testament to the Taz, um, the second one I think that I sent to you guys, I hit print while I was upstairs and you know, forgot about it for a day. And you were in. I was in, yeah, and finished. So, yeah, big ups to the team at Wolf's Block for doing you know, right. something like this. Today. There you go. Well, thank you for sharing all those steps and these resources so we can all 
you know, do what we're doing now and printing this big. Oh my goodness. Um, I wanted to leap right into our 3D and music field guide uh, to keep the theme of, uh, of music going. And here we go with one of, um, so, oops, sorry about that. So there are so many projects out there that are bringing together 3D printing and music. And here are a couple that we thought were really fun. So this is uh, Andreas Sebastian's uh, 3D printed banjo. And one of the things that's fun about this is he uses the properties of 3D printed material, um, like as we're all using on these desktop printers, uh, to, to aid you to make a, an instrument that sounds good. And he did some uh, acoustic analysis. And you can, uh, you can see a video on the, uh, uh, on the post that's up there now uh, where you can listen to how, what it's like to perform on it. Uh, here's a different take uh, that actually was a project that started earlier. It's a ukulele. The previous one was a sort of a banjo plus ukulele. Uh, but it's an attempt to make a full-size instrument on uh, you know, using the limitations of, a, of 3D printer platforms of the time. So let's see here. Here's a good view of it. So this is made by Brent, um, who had done a lot of projects such as the, uh, the, the MakerBot mascot from back in like 2011, uh, the little cute robot. Um, and he thought about how to sort of solve for the build platform size and how to, to, to accomplish things that would be kind of difficult in terms of strength um, when you try to work you know, large enough that it's a, it's a full-size instrument. Yes, it's ukulele, a little smaller uh, than you, know, you could go, um, but it was more of a, like an obtainable goal for a lot of people. And people have printed these out all over. You can, you can see ones in progress and, uh, and hear, hear them working right on them. Um, and speaking of... Uh, people around making instruments. We have Dean Miller here at Adafruit on the web dev team, uh, who's an incredible guitarist. And he used 3D printing not to make the body of his piece, but to make uh, these elements that he needed to sort of combine uh, a typical sort of guitar, electric guitar setup uh, with uh, these servo benders. Uh, that allows him to use an Arduino to, to add more control over how the strings are, are pulled taut, et cetera. And uh, go check out this video I, um, so you can hear him uh, performing on his own instrument. He really sort of tuned this process to, uh, to work well. So he probably could have produced some of these elements in a different way, but he was able to iterate and... Uh, and make these things you know, fast um, and get exactly the right sort of little custom parts he wanted uh, using a 3D printer. So it's a, great, it's a great way to use it. So in the sort of opposite extreme, um, you have Olaf uh, Daigle, who has been making 3D printed guitars for a while. Uh, you probably, if you've been following 3D printing, have seen some of his stuff before. Uh, People have performed them at all sorts of conferences, maker fairs, uh, et cetera. And they're, they're pretty impressive. People are purchasing them at sort of high expense. And they have uh, you know, a lot of customization, uh, allowing um, to you know, both express different types of shapes you might want, but also uh, change how, how, what it's like to perform it. Uh, we have a video here. Uh, that at the bottom, the 3D printed saxophone project. So this is uh, sort of a first go at a saxophone. It's interesting to watch this video, both to hear it performed and hear his notes as to what he will do differently when he approaches this not as, uh, as a replica and gets you know, further towards what really suits it as 3D printing. Had you guys seen uh, any of these uh, 3D instruments live before? Um, like the, unfortunately, we haven't seen any of them live, but we have seen some very cool uh, 3D printed um, sort of guitar-like uh, instruments, which are really fun. 
And you guys have made uh, instruments and uh, instrument enclosures before. Um, if there's a moment later, I hope to see uh, here. MIDI controllers, like the, they don't actually make sound, but they're really awesome controllers. Yeah. So here is a radically different approach to how to use 3D printing to uh, deal with sound and music. This is how to create your own 3D printed record. Uh, you won't be using a desktop 3D printer for this. Um, you'll use uh, like an SLA tool. Um, but uh, take a look at uh, these instructions and sort of what is possible when you have uh, information modeled physically for um, how to produce the sounds. This is how a record works, but we rarely think about it as being a, like a mechanical object. Mm -hmm. And speaking of mechanical objects, um, I think I didn't include it here. But if you look a little bit earlier in the day at this, here we go, we have a, a parametric music box by Philip uh, Teifenbacher, uh, who is part of uh, the Meta Lab in Vienna, a really talented hacker who made a whole bunch of projects and products and, and shared them. Uh, this is a really neat project because you can uh, you know, make a physical object that will hit those little printed tines and produce uh, the music you intend. It's, it's sort of this strange round trip where he's using all these digital tools to model and produce something uh, that physically manifests the, the sound. Um, different than the vinyl record, but a similar principle. And um, you can also make microphones. This is uh, a project by uh, Frank uh, Heisek, uh, the P-Mic, that uh, is very much about taking these two capsules and being able to position them for specific types of field recording. So in this case, the actual like, sensor element isn't printed. Uh, but having this tidy little system to be able to position those two capsules can uh, make this one tool work in many, many types of functions. There are so many ways that 3D printing music are being explored. Uh, there are a lot of whistles and panpipes. This is one of my, my favorites uh, from Ranjit uh, here in, uh, in New York. And it's a parametric tool, uh, I believe, or he, he was working from it, that would uh, allow you to work with specific scales uh, to create um, you know, your own little cluster of pipes. He, he tried some other projects like that one below. So there's a lot in the world of 3D printing music, uh, but we wanted to share a couple of things uh, to encourage you to think about 3D and music in addition to wearing your Daft Punk helmet. Yeah, that's okay. You can walk out with when you're wearing it. Oh, yeah. DIY all the way. Uh, do you, you have, uh, you want to show your guitar off? Whoa, there it is. Hey, hey, guitar. This guy is um, a couple pieces, I think uh, six or so pieces that are uh, assembled together with machine screws, but we're also using magnets. Whoa, magnets are cool. Yeah. Very but handy. These are very fun to match. These buttons light up. It's wireless. Power. And it's wireless. It's got a, a easy Bluetooth easy key. Yep. So, so that was an early project where you were involving lots of uh, Adafruit electronics. Uh, and we were, we were talking before the show some of the different ways that you, you would maybe approach the enclosure. You did it again based on, on all the things you've been doing so far and the libraries you've been building up. Yeah. It, it would. Uh, it, there's a lot of room for improvement on all of our projects, and that's why we love sharing them so people can take a look and see if they can improve on it or maybe just print it as it is. But there's a lot of room for making features and things like that, that really mount it properly. Because right now... You know, we kind of have to use tape, but uh, it's, it's always nice to use machine screws to mount the phone. And, and on that message, uh, we're going to wrap up the show for today. So, you know, take what you've learned here. Go explore all the resources we shared on our site and blog. And, uh, you know, keep your 3D Thursday going. Yeah, be sure to check out our guide on the Adafruit Learning System for all the steps and uh, details on our project. Uh, we're also on the Twitters, the Instagrams, the Thingiverses all the places. So be sure to hit us up. Yeah. Follow. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, uh, follow us on Twitter, Google+. Yeah.
behind the scenes are on there. So, uh, we'll see you next week. And until then, we'll uh, keep on printing. Yeah.